1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'll be covering uh, an advanced discipleship, like I told you for the next several weeks. I'm going to go through advanced discipleship lessons on devotionals, and it's kind of like preaching. It's life-changing, so I thought it would be appropriate. But I know that for a lot of my listeners, these are the lessons that they probably value the most is the Amen. advanced discipleship lessons on wisdom or devotional topics. So this is one of those things. I hope that people who are watching me online, they did watch the previous one. That will be very helpful because I strongly believe that sometime in the future, the devil will attack our Bible-believing movement. And because the, the evil spirit is strong at work, and we've seen it during COVID, how the devil tried to dismantle Bible-believing churches. How the devil tried to separate God's people. And not just Christian churches in general, but Bible believers. So his evil spirit is at work. And some Bible believers could be seeing some of those things. I don't want them to break the unity, the movement, the Holy Spirit, using all of them mightily. The devil's job is to break them, split them apart, and then cause a lot of disruptions. There have been scandals, unfortunately, that did happen amongst Christian pastors. And it's unfortunate, but it can happen, and I know of some throughout the past years of my life, to Bible-believing pastors that you wouldn't think would happen to. So we have to be always, as the Bible says, watch and pray. Amen. That he enter not into temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yes. Now, I strongly believe how we ended up in that mess with a lot of wolves coming out in our own Bible-believing community. I warned about that. It's possible it could happen to you. If you think because you're King James only, you're dispensational, you're Bible-believer, and that you even attend a Bible-believing church, that these wolf tendencies won't happen to you, you're totally blind. Mm -hmm. And I think I've shown you that. It's a progress mm -hmm. and a process. And that slimy, conniving serpent just gets in there. So I would strongly recommend for those of you who weren't there last Sunday to please watch it. Those of you who have not watched the lesson last Sunday to please watch it. Now I'm going to be covering the topic on charity. And charity will help you with some things concerning about wolfish tendencies that can happen. And a lot of other things that you go through in life. So let's go through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the doctrine on charity. No, we do not know that doctrine as much as we should know. So I would like to expound on that one. The Bible says, verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in an but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Amen. Will you pray with me? Now, Father, help me to preach and teach what is truth and error. And if there's righteous indignation or any compassion, I pray that it will be done in the right way that you want it to be laid out. I pray that this will protect our people, protect our Bible believers in their Bible believing movement, and even for myself, because I am prone. So will you protect all of us, and may these lessons be eye-opening and helpful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, Amen. I want to emphasize something. It's always an extreme with these two things. If you've studied our beginner's discipleship, so if you're new to this, then you're going to totally misunderstand what I'm going to teach to you today. So in new classes, beginner's discipleship classes, I've taught you 
the doctrine of fellowship and separation, as well as judging others. And then I've talked about the importance of balancing these two extremities. So if you are new, then you're going to totally misunderstand today's teaching. But if you're already familiar with these concepts that I've taught, then this is going to make more sense to you, and you're not going to wrongly apply it. Now, in our day and age, there is so much wrong doctrine out there. So it is important that Bible-believing pastors expose it, call it out. Sometimes they will even use sarcasm, criticism, and name-calling. Now that's the problem with this extreme of the loving world. They think that that's just being mean, that's not being Christ-like. But you don't know what Christ-like is. Right, right. Because Jesus Christ, he took out a whip, a bunch of cords, and then beat people out of the synagogue. Amen. Now, if I call out names and use sarcasm, you walk out mad, but if I beat you with a cord, you'd sue me. But you think that Jesus Christ was loving and he never did something extreme like that. See, the point is, is that when we stand for right doctrine and truth, because of that pervasiveness and that widespread wrong influence of people so, so much being deceived, sometimes you need something strong so you can get people's attention. Right. The problem nowadays is that we're in a, a feminine Christianity. They lost their aggressive mode. So because of that, the unbelievers have taken advantage of them because the believing crowd have not called them out. The reason why Christians have grown apostate, cold, and into wrong doctrine is because they have not been aggressively attacked for falling into wrong doctrine. And they should be aggressively attacked. We've lost that aggressive mode. But remember, I talked to you about the balance of loving others. So if you are constantly that way, berating people, stuff like that, then that's not right. Because the book of Ephesians says, be angry and sin not. Yeah. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, that should not be your personality all the time. Right. So if they never see you loving people, then you're in the wrong, definitely. Jesus Christ, we've seen his act of love, haven't we? Yes. So because we know that, because he died for sinners, and he loved them enough where they would even... Uh, scoff him, mock him, torture him. That's why we don't dare accuse Jesus of being unloving, even if he scourged, uh, even if he whipped people out of a marketplace or out of a synagogue. So loving others with that thing in mind, that doesn't mean that oh we stand for right doctrine. So because of that, um, I can criticize my pastor, my uh, fellow Christian peers in church. So remember, I taught you what helps you balance it out on how much you judge others and how much you can call it out and how much you should love and how much you shouldn't abuse love is because of what I mentioned before. Look at the sins. Are they major? Look at the doctrines. Are they major? So that's why we can call it out. If they're minor, then leave it alone, all right, because everybody has differences. But the question is, what makes it major? What makes it minor? That's why I talked about finding a Bible-believing church. When you attend a Bible-believing church, hang around Bible believers, you find out what things are major to them and what things are minor to them. Not things that are major to the Christian world or things that are minor to the Christian world. Majority of them are apostate. So because of that, they're obviously more effeminate. They're obviously less true. And they'll accuse you of being hateful when you're not even being hateful. Right. Wow. So, uh, if this is new to you, this should have been a lesson a long time ago. So I want to stress that, emphasize that so much. I'm just reviewing all that. That way people don't misunderstand what I'm going to get into Amen. now. Okay? Amen. Now, what I'm getting into is in our Bible-believing crowd, this balance, now you're graduating your discernment more on a whole nother level. So now you have to use this level in your own Bible-believing crowd. How much you should stand for right doctrine and how much you should love others. The reason why I emphasize that is because Bible-believing pastors, they can do some major sins and major own doctrine. They're susceptible. They're not uh, free from that. So we have to know how much we can call them out, but because they're our own crowd, our own family, we know that 
our love of level for them is more so, more favorable to them than the lost world and the apostate Christians, right? Our compassion for them, our patience for them should be more so with our own family, our own team. Amen. Not the wrong crowd, not the enemy team, not the wrong team, right? So then how do we balance these two? Because we're the evil spirit is so much hard at work nowadays where it's not just uh, the apostate Christians or the lost world that's uh, messing up in sin or teaching wrong doctrines. It's our own crowd. Why? Because history repeats itself. Yep. If history repeats itself, mankind always go on a decline. Yep. So just because you're in the right crowd, right Bible-believing crowd, doesn't mean that they're free from declining. Right. They do decline as well. So how do we balance this? How do we know when to call it out? How do we know when, uh, how much love we should bestow? And I believe so many Bible believers, including Bible believing pastors nowadays, they just get this wrong and then they make wrong judgment calls, wrong discernment, and then they just cause more harm than good. Especially if you're a pastor, your sheep watch you and they will follow what you do. Right. Come on, so you're right. held accountable for that. That's right. Right. Amen. If you're a parent, your children are going to obviously follow you. Yeah, that's right. So if that Bible-believing family walks out of the church, guess what? The kids follow along with you, not just you. Right. That's right. If you see that there's something wrong here. If the family decides to stay in the church when there's corruption going on in the church, and I'm talking about Bible-believing, then the kids will stay with you too. Yep. See, this is a lot of responsibility and accountability. Yeah. This is why this is an, an advanced lesson. Amen. So we need to understand this how. The basic doctrine. Always basics become advanced. Yeah. Like I taught you before. So the basic doctrine, charity. Charity is the key where you can get all the commandments of the Lord right. So let's start off with Matthew 22. Okay, Matthew 22. Jesus told you. That to make sure that you do everything right, follow everything according to God's will, make sure you're not doing anything wrong, you're going to keep all of God's commandments, is by these two rules. All right, Matthew chapter 22. It's loving God and loving others. Loving God and loving others. You might say that I know, I know, and I'm going to show you, Amen. hopefully, that you really don't know. Amen. Come on. That's not to say that I know better than you. No, it's because I'm like you. So I don't know any better, too. So th these are the kind of stuff that I developed through, obviously, many years of many different Bible-believing churches and pastors that I've undergone and experienced. It's not something that I uh, conjured up myself or something self from me. I don't think I'm that great of a guy. If I didn't have other Bible believers around me, then I don't know where I would have ended up in. So Matthew chapter 22, and then we'll look at verse 36. Verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Okay, the first greatest commandment is to love God with everything you've got. Okay? Yep. Amen. But then the next part and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So you got to love your neighbor as much as you would love yourself. Yeah. Amen. Verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Notice right here, everything you know about right doctrine, right commandments, do everything right accordingly to the will of God, will hang on these two things. And these two simple things are a lot more deeper than you think. Yeah. And we don't really understand these two that well. So, what I would like to help you is if we start out in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It shows how much we should love God and how much we should love others. Now, I'm going to uh, give examples. That way, Bible believers can better comprehend. Usually if I say stuff, it's agreeable, but if I were to bring out examples, then it becomes more clear and it'll become more helpful, okay? Uh, no, I do not want to clear all my notes. 
demon-possessed whiteboard. The devil don't want me to teach this lesson. <laughs> All right, anyways. <clears throat> Here's a Bible believer who stands for right doctrine and right truth. So he's all about truth. Because of that perception, what happens is, then he's going to come across scenarios and situations where other Bible-believing pastors, they may not be following the right doctrines like he is doing. Because of that, it's going to be easy for that Bible-believing pastor to judge that other Bible-believing pastor and that other Bible-believing church. All right, now I'm not talking about plain heresy, major wrong doctrine. I am talking about situations where it's not clear in the Bible. Now, if someone says, I deny that Jesus is God, oh my goodness, uh, I mean, that's pretty clear in the Bible, that's heresy, okay? But they're going to come across doctrines or teachings that they're going to say, and you're not really sure if it's right or wrong. They might pull up a verse and say, hey, here's a verse, and this said, and this verse says, you have to be doing it this way. And if that church and that pastor doesn't follow it that way, then do you have the right to call them out? Do you have the right to judge them? After all, it's contradicting the word of God. And you're all about truth and right doctrine. And I'm talking about in our Bible-believing crowd with a doctrine that you never thought of before if it's serious. All right? Now, I talked to you before that how you can tell if it's serious enough is if it's major or minor, right? Yeah. In your Bible-believing crowd. <coughs> but here's something what people don't understand. There is a thing called crowd mentality. And they're looking up at a prime leader. And when that prime leader says something, the crowd goes with the flow. Now, if you don't think that's never possible, then you don't know your history, okay? If I teach something that's not really clear in the Bible, but sounds a little extreme and uncomfortable to you, think about it. If we have five of our main members here who agree with it, what's the crowd going to do? Agree. See? Yeah, agree. Yeah, that brother's agreeable. He just said agree. We'll agree with that. But anyway, joking aside, the point is, see, it, it is a real-life situation here. And it happens. If you've been around Bible-believing churches for 10 to 20 years, it's inevitable. You will see that. So Bible-believing preachers, they'll criticize each other because the reason why is one Bible-believing preacher thinks that, hey, you followed something that was non-unscriptural. So because of that, I distance from you, or I separate from you, or I even call you out, or I tell other Bible-believing churches and other Bible believers that, hey, that pastor's wrong. That church is wrong. That person's wrong. Stay away from that person. And then guess what? The crowd flows. Amen. Okay? Amen. That's extremely important to understand. That's a real-life situation. Amen. It happens. And they're all about doctrinal truth. When that person does that, he could be wrong in doing that. That's very important to understand. He could be right, he could be wrong. But how do you know? See, how do you know? We need things that can help us. So let's start out this way, okay? Let's first critique these areas. How you know you're on the right path is you need to self-check. You need to critique. If you never critique, then you're always going to be a gullible, vulnerable person or an arrogant, egotist person that thinks whatever you do is always right. Yeah. Just like every liberal and unbeliever right now. Yeah. They think whatever they're doing is not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. What usually helps you stay in the right is you discover what's wrong first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? So, you have to think about what's wrong with that first. Now, in our mind, see, when we see this, that's not wrong. See that? But really, are those the right words? What if it's this? What if it's more so of uh, this? Will that change? Knowledge means that it doesn't mean that it necessarily has to be wrong information all the time, see? 
It's just all the information, good and bad and other things. It's all of that. But let's even assume knowledge is just only good information. Then could that hinder charity? That could. <coughs> yes, that could. Good. Brother is very observant there. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a basic, we all should know this. The Bible says in verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy. See that? So dispensationalism is a branch of prophecy for some of you who didn't know. So that's a really important doctrine that we agree with. And understand all mysteries. So that means even deep doctrines. Oh, he majors in that doctrine. And all knowledge. See, no exception, even good. And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, what? I am nothing. I am nothing. So what does that mean? All the right doctrine you know can count zero. zero. And you are no different from a lost person who is into wrong doctrine. Zero. You're just as zero as the unbeliever who's into wrong doctrine. That's very important to understand. So this can all count for nothing. All right, now that we understand, we can, we have not discerned it out how to balance this, okay? We'll get to that later. But we can agree this can be dangerous, right? Yes. Yes, yes. okay, so yes. we agree so far. That's yes. danger, that's wrong. Yes, that's dangerous. Okay, we'll discern that later. We'll balance it out later. See this balance here, the right? Yep. We'll get there eventually. But first, let's, find out what's wrong. That way we can, once we find the wrong, then we find the wrong more, the right more, and then see that? And you get in the balance. Yes. That's exactly. how you do it. Okay. Next one is loving others. All right. Now that's, see that? We automatically think charity through that word. So uh, the problem with Bible-believing, uh, Bible-believing churches, people, and pastors too, is that, so here's one Bible believer who calls it out judges another Bible believer or a Bible believing preacher and calls them out, exposes them, criticizes them, whatever, okay? Sure. Then you got the other extreme of Bible believers, including pastors that think that you're just being so divisive. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says that we're supposed to love each other. Yes. I mean, we're all in the same family. Yes. And, you know, that's correct. You have to think more deeply here, okay? So, it's true that you can hit in danger land over here, but that kind of mentality of, hey, let's just all get along, that's also very dangerous too. You know why? Because what, what is inevitable if you become a Bible-believing pastor is that you can't fellowship with every Bible believer. Now, let me repeat that again. That might be shocking to some of you, but you need to hear this. I taught this in our advanced discipleship a long time ago, all right? But not every Bible-believing pastor or church fellowships with every Bible-believing pastor in church. That's true. You might say, why is that? Why can't we, uh, aren't we all on the same team? Why can't we all love each other? Yeah. Because they know some personality problems with this pastor and church that you and I don't know about. Yeah. And it's not worth calling it out because we're all on the same team. Amen. So they just leave them to the Lord, yes. but they can't fellowship as close either. That's good. Yeah. So they'll find ways to distance themselves. Now, if you uh, here's the problem with some Bible-believing pastors. If you're more used to connecting and fellowshipping with Bible believers, and there's hardly any anybody that you distance from, you should question yourself. Amen. In being this extreme. Yeah. Because that's such a vulnerable, nonchalant, gullible attitude to think that every Bible-believing pastor is perfect. Yeah. See, we have to understand everybody is human and simple, including me yeah. and Bible believers. Yeah. Why? We're all human. Right. We all make mistakes. We're yes. perfect. If you don't believe that, then you probably never got married before. <laughs> you probably never had kids. Notice the people that you're close to, who are you are the most closest to, you find faults. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have such a gullible, uh, you know, nonchalant attitude, hey, we're all Bible believers and let's all get along. No. 
Okay? So, can we agree that this is a problem? Yeah, because the problem with this that people don't recognize is go to 1 Corinthians 13. What if it's worded differently? See that? Loving others. What if that's worded differently? When we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible says in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Now, see that? That person is doing acts of charity. Yeah. That's what charity means. <laughs> Nowadays, charity organizations. It's to give to others. Actually, that's the right definition of charity. It's giving. Yeah. But notice, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not what? Charity. Charity, it profiteth me nothing. Oh. Then it's not defined as charity. Oh. Oh. Why is that? Because there's something self-centered there. Ah, uh, wow. It's to make them look good. Ooh. You know why people do the love others? It's more of a politic politicking thing, polit politics thing, more than really genuinely loving others. Wow. It's not them deceive themselves into thinking, I'm doing this because I love others. No, you're doing it to establish connections. Preach. To make yourself look good. Or you just like it when people love you. Wow. Preach. Preach. That's good. That's something. Yep. Wow. Wow. Okay? A lot of times people have the agreeable attitude because they just don't want tension. deeper than you think. Oh, so, uh, when you look at verse 4, notice it says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity what? Vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. Yeah. Are you loving others so that you can look good? Wow. Mm. That's deep. <laughs> then there's that puffing up there, right? That vaunteth itself. Charity should not vaunt itself. That's why people want to get into these pastors' conferences and establish, uh, you know, good relationships and all that. Makes them look good, including Bible believers. Wow. See, this is deeper than you think here. Okay. Now, notice right here, uh, the verse says, verse five, doth not behave itself unseemly. What? Seek it. See, you have an agenda there. Why are you fellowship? Why are you maintaining relationship with that Bible-believing pastor, that Bible-believing church over there? Yeah. It's because you have a self-agenda there. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have an agenda of all there. I've seen some sneaky guys come in. Some of people in this church have seen those type of people, and they call themselves Bible-believers, but those guys have caused utmost shame to our Bible-believing family. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then we had to do separation. We had to distance, or we even had to call them out. Wow. Yeah, I'm talking about Bible believers. <laughs> Isn't that sad? It is sad. It's uh, sad, but sad. if you are in gullible mode thinking that Bible believers really love each other without seeking her own, seeking yeah. an agenda wow. on something, then you're gullible. That's right. Wow. So notice right here, it's not love others. Let's reword it. It's Agenda for self. It's an agenda. Wow. For self benefit. Wow. Are you doing that to benefit yourself? Wow. You know what charity is? It's sacrifice. It has no benefit to yourself. Yeah. You know what's even more disgusting? I've, it, it, it is more fouled up and disgusting with these satanic wolves who call themselves Bible believers who would always play the charity card and act like the victim or act like that, oh, you Bible believers are so judgmental after they manipulated and abused people. Now, that's a common thing, unfortunately, with IFB churches. They play the good guy, the loving person and stuff like that. And if you don't do something for him, then they... Make you look like the bad guy. Wow. Now I, I'll be, I, I'm just saying this metaphorically, but I wow. hate people like that. Yeah. I really hate that. All right, I don't literally hate them, but it just t turns up my emotions so much. Yeah. You don't play with people like that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Agreed. It's a disgusting thing. Agreed. So 
Sometimes I don't know what's worse, the guy who does that or the guy who acts like a jerk and hurt people deliberately. At least this one's more honest. Yes. And you know where that person stands. This person is just conniving, manipulating, and then puts on this cloak of loving, loving, loving. Now that's why a lot of people will be deceived online when they watch me, and then they think that I'm just too mean when I call out some people. Because the one that I call out who pulled the charity card yeah. to make himself look good when that guy's actually a wolf. Amen. Okay, so we can agree there are people... Look, can't you agree that amongst thousands of Bible believers, there's probably two that are like this? Can't you just admit that much? Yes. There's, there's bound to be, right? There's bound to be. Or even two like this one, just two out of thousands. Look, we're talking about reality here. If you don't think so, then you're more gullible than I thought. You, you don't have any wisdom. Especially pastors. That's, that's more shameful. Okay? All right, now we can agree that there are dangers here. Yeah, correct? Dangerous. And I'm only talking about our own Bible-believing crowd. Okay? Oh. But we can see how this could be also applicable sometimes to the outside world, right? So we've seen that. But now, what makes our Bible-believing crowd more different than the outside world is that they're our family. Obviously, when you have your own family, and then you call them out, or you judge them, or you correct them, or you love them, or you put up with them, yeah. you have a different level there with your family compared to people who are not your flesh and blood family, correct? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty obvious, all right? Like, I could get upset at my wife, and my wife can get upset at me at things that they can't dare do to any of you. But also, my wife and I, we love each other, give more favoritism to each other than we do with any of you. See, that's a real, realistic thing. Yep. So we know that's just common sense. Yep. So, if we have that with our flesh and blood family, that's even more so with our spiritual family who have the same bloodline, blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to use these things in operation as well. So we know that we can't treat our family just like we would with the apostate lost world out there, or our enemies out there. It's very, very different how we use this charity aspect with the ones who are our own family. But we know that within our own family, it's very likely, it is very, well not likely, but possible, okay, it does happen this and this. Yes. We know that, even with our own flesh and blood family, that yes. happens. That happens. Yes. So that's why when we deal with scenarios like this, we need more wisdom, discernment. So let's filter it down and then figure out how we can use charity correctly in filtering it. And actually, I believe that's the answer, it's charity. Charity is the answer to all of this. Yes. We've now exposed the errors of doctrine, doctrine, and truth, truth. It's all about the truth. And you got to love people. They're your brother and sister in Christ. we got to love them as Christ loved them. We've exposed those two errors. Because those two errors are not really about doctrine and truth or loving others as Christ loved them. It's more about agenda to make yourself look good. The praise of men more than the praise of God. And it's all about knowledge. Sure. I'm right. So if you don't follow me, then you're wrong. See? So we've exposed those two things. Sure. But they're going to be cloaked with these words, and you better watch out for them. If you hear so many pastors preaching about this, or pastors too much preaching about that, there's going to be a suspicion light sometimes with how they pastor people, or talk to people, or deal with people. You are what you think, you are what you say. You have to be very careful of that, okay? Now, I'm not saying, if, uh, because I emphasize so much on right doctrine, right? So I preach that. That don't mean that you're suspicious of me and that, you know, watch out, he's going to be a jerk, you know, stuff like that. Or that if I preach a lot of time loving other people, which I do, I always cram on you guys, say hi to someone you didn't say hi to, right? That doesn't make you suspicious and go, that guy is very weird, you know. I wonder if he has some agenda. What's, why is he doing that? Why did he come to me and say hi to me? Does he have something in mind? And some of you might be thinking that, right? But anyway, uh, that's beside the point. But I get that, okay? So I get that.
get that. So I'm not saying, you know, just be so paranoid and then you get suspicious, but I'm telling you also don't be so gullible and dumb either, okay? Now, in dealing with these issues, let's look at a few things that uh, might be helpful. First of all, we do know in Proverbs chapter 1, the easy answer to this, which is more deep than you think, is you need wisdom. Whenever you're going through a complicated, no matter what complicated scenario you go through, the thing that you're seeking after is wisdom, correct? Yeah, wisdom is the thing. Wisdom is the thing that you're running after, that you want. So go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Notice in verse 20, verse 20. If you want to make a right decision, the answer is wisdom. I need wisdom. Things that are not clear in the Bible. A situation that you don't know what to do. A situation if you don't know if the guy is doing something to catch you on something. Or if the guy is just being too much and too extreme and mean and too harsh. That's why in this scenario you need wisdom. I know that's like a dull thing, but you really don't know this dull thing. Like I taught you before, people who are really smart or get into deeper stuff, they always challenge the basics. Mm -hmm. They always dig deeper into the basic. Not some other new verse out there to find to support your ideology. There are things in the Bible you're not going to find. Right. Right. You need to go back to the same old, same old verses that God gave to you. Because he knows that's sufficient for even the most complicated decisions in life. Okay? So let's go to wisdom, all right? We know that. That's just a no-brainer. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, and then verse 20, Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. Verse 22, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. So notice right here that wisdom is not the same as knowledge. But knowledge is within wisdom. Another thing is that it condemns simplicity. So you don't want to be gullible. You don't want to be dumb. Now, we need wisdom in these situations when we are dealing with hard life decisions. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13. So what does that mean? That means that when you do something not clear in the Bible, think about this, think about this. How can knowledge work if there's, no, if there's no knowledge in that Bible, clear knowledge in the Bible that you can use for your information gathering? See that? So it's not going to work. But wisdom will be the key. Wisdom is different. Why? The clear difference is knowledge is things that you know. Wisdom is knowing, and you've heard this quite often from Bible-believing preachers. Wisdom is knowing how to use the knowledge. So we're not condemning, get this, we're not condemning the truth that you have in your mind. Amen. Truth is truth, it will stand out. And if that person's wrong, that person's wrong. But how do you use that truth when you communicate to that person? Amen. Or when it comes out of you? And if you are doing it where you know something that the other person doesn't know, and then you embarrass that person, or you shame that person, or you are like so harsh in calling out that person and, call, and making sure everybody calls out that person, I don't think you're using that knowledge well. See, you need to know how to use it. How? Yeah. So just because some Bible believer knows it all and has more knowledge, and I don't care, they can know more than I do, all right? They're stinking no wisdom whatsoever. They're just dumber than a bag of, rock, bag of rocks. <laughs> you have to realize that wisdom is something that's more prized, and you have to go by how to use it. So with uh, Bible believers, how do we use it? 
Well, notice right here that in verse 2, that knowledge is not the same as charity. See that? It's not the same as charity in verse 2. So, now we got the answer here. All you have to do is just get out of this. So, wisdom is how to use a knowledge. And how you know you can use it is due to charity. What is charity? We saw the two greatest commandments, right? So it's about God and others. Amen. So embarrassing that person who's a fellow Bible believer like you, is that really uh, thinking about that other person? No. Are you really being considerate? Now, look what charity is, okay? Uh, if we saw charity, it's all about truth. Yes. It is. Charity is about truth. When we uh, look at verse 6, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in what? The truth. The truth. Yeah. See that? So, it is something that is true. True. But at the same time, it's not the same like knowledge. In other words, the key difference with knowledge and truth is truth has charity, knowledge doesn't. See that? So that's the missing ingredient for truth, for right information or knowledge, is charity. Amen. Then that means you know how to use it. Then wisdom is at play. So think about this, okay? If, uh, so if, let's say a Bible-believing Bible pastor is wrong, okay, about something. And it's not a minor thing. It's a major thing, okay? So remember, major and minor, okay? So let's say it's a major thing to you. It's something very major. Then what should you do with the truth that you know and how to communicate it in love? Then, if you start being considerate about that person, your communication comes out right. Maybe you can ask a question. Yeah. Pastor, you said this, but I, in my Bible, I remember reading this verse. How do you answer that? Why, it could be for all you know, you're the one who misunderstands, see? Right. Because the pastor knows more Bible than you. And then, you're, a lot of times, your concerns are clear. Or, you'd be surprised, the pastor will say, you're right, actually, that's not what I meant. I meant it this way. I should have reworded that way. I'm sorry. Amen. Amen. Isn't that a wiser thing than just, in the middle of preaching, you just lift up... Get yourself up and point your finger. Heretic! Yeah. <laughs> Dumb move. Yeah. Yeah. Dumb move. Yeah. Dumb move. Alright, now let me give another example, okay? Another one is uh, couldn't you do it like where the pastor, he does something major. It's wrong. Maybe something inappropriate or wrong action he did. That's like borderline sin. And it's pretty serious to you. So then, you come up to the pastor, and then, would it be right to say, hey, you're wrong about that, or, hey, pastor, um, I'll be honest, when you did it that way, to me, uh, it felt, uh, I felt very uncomfortable because blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And you worded it in a way where it's understandable yeah. for the pastor, because that's what charity is, considerate of others. So you word it in a way, yeah. That's considerate of them, that they will understand. And don't you think you're going to listen to you more? Yeah, right. They're going to listen to you more. The reason why you're not really good at uh, persuasion skills or social skills is you're not considerate of others. Yeah. Good wisdom. Now, that's eye-opening for even real-life situations. Right. Yeah. For dealing with bosses that you have a hard time putting up with. Or brothers and sisters in Christ. Or even family arguments. Yeah. Yeah. See, this will change you a lot, okay? So you got to realize charity is a big factor here. Wow. That's good. Well, they got to understand me on this one. And when you keep saying that, then see, you don't have charity. It's not about you. Charity is God and others. The only reason why, see this? I don't know if you caught this. The only reason why you disagreed with the pastor or confronted the pastor is not because it crossed the line with you. It crossed the line with God. 
It's a wrong, it, it plainly contradicts his word. Or it's something that violates his law. It seems borderline sin or sin to me. See that? It's not about you. It's about God. Right. That's why you would do the confrontation. A little bit I have to So, that's how you deal with the case with uh, knowledge. Because what's the most dangerous thing? The most dangerous thing is if it is about you, and then you have the knowledge, you're not going to persuade that person to your side. They're going to think you're just selfish and you're smarter than me and you're just taking advantage of me. You better watch out for that. Wow. All right? You want, to, you want that person to understand that you're more about charity than knowledge. Yeah. You know what's very, uh, you know how I can convince my wife most of the time uh, when, we, when I confront her or disagree with her? When she knows that, I'm, that I love her, not that I'm trying to win an argument. Because she knows the schools that I came from right. and how my, fast my mind can work and uh, critique and demolish arguments. So see, it's easy for her to feel that I'm trying to take advantage or trying to win an argument. <coughs> you think you're going to win the love of your spouse that way? Every other bow and every eye should once altar call right now. Okay? So see, you have to, they have to see more of charity. Charity is the victory for this. Where they can see it and they'll more listen to you. <coughs> now, that helps a lot with this side. Now, what about this side here? How do we uh, deal with this issue? So then, again, use wisdom. So here's a person who's trying to take advantage of you. Then what did the verse said in charity? Rejoiceth not in iniquity, right? Mm -hmm. But rejoiceth in the what? Truth. Truth. Truth divides. Truth divides. So if you're all, wisdom is not just loving the person and ignoring what is true there. If there's a, if the Holy Spirit is dealing with you on something, and that is true, the Bible says the spirit of truth lead and guide you into all truth, correct? You cannot sacrifice your conscience just to please the other person. I may repeat that again. You cannot sacrifice your conscience for the other person. You want evidence of that? Romans chapter 14 talks about conscience here. Yeah. And it says right here, you cannot violate your own conscience. Yeah. Or enforce your conscience upon another person that violates his conscience. Yeah. See, that's the truth. It divides, but also it doesn't cause that much of a dramatic division like you think. It unifies, uh, it unites, and it divides. Truth is about uh, dividing and unifying. It's not just one thing or the other. Yep. Truth is all about that. So when you rejoice in the truth, see that? And then you have to have charity, right? With the other person. What happens? Why? You're going to have to try to stick close. As long as you try to stick close to the truth, while you're loving others, see that? You're not going to agree or do the things that the other person's doing. Or follow everything that person's doing. See that? You can love the person, fellowship with the person, uh, a fellow Bible believer, while they teach something that's different from you or that's wrong from you. And you can fellowship with that person or be around that person because it has nothing to do with you. Because you, you already know the truth. You already know the right doctrine. Think about the church in general. When you think about the church in general, the people over there, Bible-believing preachers teaches something uh, or says something or does something uh, that's disagreeable with your spiritual conscience and conviction that's wrong. So a great example, all right? Some of you might get shocked. Some of you might agree. I don't care, all right? But we don't do Christmas here. Okay, so I don't do Christmas. I think nope. it's a pagan thing. But there are some things that we do, like giving each other Christmas gifts, right? Yes. If someone says Merry Christmas to me, I'm not going to say, you know, Happy Semiramis Day to you. Right? I'll just say Merry Christmas back to them. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So if people have a Christmas tree in their home, I'm not going to go knock on their door and visitation. Yeah. Yeah. Go to their tree and cut it down for yeah. a million dollars. That pay like tree, I'm going to cut it down like Gideon. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. 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 If 
in my home, I might do it. <laughs> That's my spiritual conscience. <laughs> anyway, well, uh, joking aside, but see right there is that when you're thinking about the people in general, and then you're loving them, you're not sacrificing truth by letting them do that. Because for them, they're not thinking about pagan holiday. To them, they're just thinking about, hey, it's a time where I can think about my, uh, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and right. more. Amen. And I like to celebrate that one. Amen. So, for you, it's paganism, but to them, it's different. Right. So, you can let that go. Yeah. And then, Amen. If you, don't, you don't have to build a Christmas tree just because other people are doing it. That's Does right. that make any sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. So, when we do this, you're not agreeing with them or following along with them, but you're staying in the truth. Now, here's another thing. Let's get this deeper. Let's say they, uh, a pastor uh, does something that, uh, that is plainly wrong, but it's not clear in the Bible. Can I repeat that again? Yeah. It's plainly wrong, but it's not clear in the Bible. Well, that don't make sense. No, it makes sense. Romans 14. Yeah. The verse shows that the, the conscience and the conviction is strong. It's strong and clear and plain to you. But it's not found in the word of God. So to the other brother and sister, it's not clear. Yep. See that? All right, so let me repeat that again. You see something that's plainly wrong to you, whether it be uh, a practice or a doctrine, plainly wrong to you. However, it's not that clear from the Bible, and it's not that plain to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. What do you do? You cannot just go along with the flow. So, but you want to maintain the love. So, the people, and this is just common sense, I've seen people do it. It's like an unconscious instinct. Won't they, like, make up excuses? Won't they go like, hey, you know, I'm sick or I'm busy or I have family obligations? Or maybe they'll just tell them, I don't agree in doing that, but uh, that's why I cannot follow along with you on that one. But you guys go ahead if that's what the Lord laid on your heart to do. Because I have no proof or clarity from the Bible what you're doing is exactly wrong. Yeah. Yeah. See that? What's that? Wisdom. Wisdom. Standing for the truth, but see that? Communicating in a way that they'll understand. Mm -hmm. This is the answer. That's the key ingredient right there. Here's another one. There's some Bible believing. This happens quite often, okay? And I did this in our other advanced discipleship study, so I hope this is helpful to you. But there are Bible-believing preachers that I just don't fellowship with. Uh, but I don't call them out. And also, I even recommend those Bible-believing preachers. But I just don't fellowship with them, or I distance from them. I even had some preach in my church. And now they're not going to preach again, okay? So I've heard that because I know things about them that the people don't know. Why? Because it's none of their business. I'm thinking about charity. Okay? I'm trying to practice and enact charity here. But I ain't going to be so gullible by having such a person preach on my pulpit again. Or think that we're buddy-buddy. Because then that person will think that I agree with his conviction. Then, in, in promoting and spreading his conviction. When I'm certainly against it. So, what I do in those cases... So, what I do is, it's very simple. I love them in the Lord, but I just don't be with them. <laughs> Let them run their ministry, I run mine. See, problem solved. Yep. So, there's a distance there. It's a gradual graduation of distance. Let's say we're all in a revival meeting together, and there's no escaping from that person. What do I do? Just say hi, that's it. A yep. few words, that's it. That don't mean I approve or I agree with his uh, wrong doctrine or his wrong stance. And that doesn't mean I acknowledge it. I still clung on to it, but I'm putting, making sure that I do or say things that won't compromise this. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. So I do, is there ways I can do or say things where I don't compromise this? Very worst case of worst case of worst case scenario. Pastor and member does something wrong. Plain sin, all right? Some sexual scandal happens, or some money scandal happens, something very bad happens, okay? And there's nothing clear that you have. What do you do as a member? Should I stay, or should I leave, or should I rebuke, uh, should I... Well, here's the thing there. Uh, the easy answer is, is if there's something that you have no 
clear proof, and then there's something playing that happened, then all you have to do is just find a different Bible-believing church. Problem solved. You don't have to deal with that problem. You don't have to deal with those people. You don't have to ruin your own testimony. Amen. It's that simple. Just You don't have to call them out. You don't have to talk bad about them. Just leave and find another Bible-believing ministry or church Amen. to attend. <laughs> it's that simple. Amen. Well, I have no Bible-believing church to go to. I know of some who had a really bad scandal going on in their church. And other Bible-believing pastors know about it, and it's a shameful thing. So then those people, when they leave, then they're like, am I sinning because I'm no longer attending that Bible-believing church? There's no other Bible-believing church that I can go to. Then I would just simply say, like I taught you in a Beginner's Discipleship, you go from A church to a B grade level church. B grade. That's it. Well, should I go to an A grade church? It's not an A grade church when something bad happens. That's already an F grade. Yeah. Right. No matter how much right doctrine they have. Okay. See that? So just go to the second best church. It's that simple. Now, we understand now how this works more and more. You just want to use wisdom. So basically, think about things that I can say or do where I don't compromise the truth. Things that I can say and do that others will understand. See that? If a person left the Bible-believing church and then told me about this horrible scandal that happened, what's that? That's an understandable situation. See that? The person who tells me would realize, hey, the person would understand <laughs> what I'm going through right here. This is a, con I'm considering that person and that person would definitely understand. See, you have to consider about others. When you consider about others, then you know the decisions that you make will be more wise. So, see that? That's a key right there. I'm telling you, this is so key. Others, 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 others. So, Think about it. Would they understand your decision? Didn't you know I know of Bible believers who left uh, their churches and even pastors understand why they left? Why? Because they made sure that when they make the decision, it's something that they would understand. Amen. Or they communicated or told it in a way where they would understand. Does that make any sense? Yes. So think about where people will understand. People will agree with you. People can see why spiritually, see that? Do you? Against your conviction? It's plainly wrong. But see, this is not about you. Charity is others. So will others see it the way you see it? That's eye-opening. So you got to do things in a way where people do see it. Now, let's say that um, you are right. Now, this is very rare, okay? But it can happen. 0.1% of the time, you're going to come across situations, you're the only one that's right, and everybody's wrong. <laughs> Everyone won't understand. Now, this is a very dangerous field. Yes. This is commonly used amongst church members. If you do that, I'm going to have the first sign of suspicion on you, so don't try this, okay? But it does happen, and we are getting into deep, complicated areas because it did happen with me and I've seen it happen with some people, okay? It does happen. It's just life, okay? So let's say you're the only one that's right. Everybody's wrong, okay? What are you going to do? Again, think about how others would see it. So make sure you do things or say things where people can understand, agree, and they won't really judge you. See that? So maybe you don't have to tell the person about the problem going on in the church. You can simply say, the Lord put me in a different situation where I should be helping this pastor here in this church. And then say it in a way they would understand. Isn't that a wise thing to do? And then later on, let the Lord expose those people who are wrong. It's just that simple. So remember, it's all about saying and doing things that people will understand yeah. and agree. Amen. When you do things like that, you will protect your testimony. You won't make yourself look like a jerk, but you also won't compromise your spiritual conviction. 
Does that make any sense? Amen. All right. So this will be extremely helpful to you. Amen. All right. Let's uh, move along. Now, let's apply these things. Uh, oh, it's, <laughs> it's time. Okay. <laughs> wow. Doesn't time fly? <laughs> How about I do that uh, next Bible study? All right. All right. I'll continue in the next Bible study. Maybe I'll expand more things on that one, too. But the lesson on charity should be very eye-opening, how you deal with those scenarios. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's uh, preaching, teaching, or doctrinal preaching has been very helpful to these people, especially people out there who are going through very complicated, complex scenarios. It will happen to us Bible believers one day where we feel betrayed and where we feel hurt and we don't know which side to go to. And the devil will succeed in doing that. I pray that Bible believers, they won't be swayed. They'll find their faith in you and realize that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And they can maintain their sanity, make the right decision, and not be confused. In Jesus' name we pray. 